Hi everyone and welcome to Youth Rises CND vlog for 2022. Today marked the beginning of the 65th session on the Commission on Narcotic Drugs. I started with uh, the increasing social capital through protective factors of drug use initiation side event. Um, this was focused mainly around the Icelandic model of prevention. Um, so they spoke about young people a lot. Um, the most of it was talking about how to um, prevent young people from getting into um, drug use and um, how they are the most vulnerable. Representatives from Iceland and the UNODC spoke about um, how there is huge amounts of juvenile um, drug use in Iceland and the approaches of scaring youth away didn't work, um, which we we know did not work for a long time now so they researched um, evidence-based approaches and they came up with this Icelandic model of um, trying to um, improve the social determinants um, and improve social capital for young people and um, to be able to prevent them from drug use Talk about how um, this has been introduced in the 90s and since the 1998 drug use has been reducing in Iceland um, then they had people talk from Kenya and from um, Latin America I couldn't catch which country um, discussing just generally um, the methods put in place for um, prevention along with this Icelandic approach. Um, one of the speakers talked heavily about um, sports and the, the how sports and involvement in leisure activities can really prevent young people from um, using drugs. As a young person uses drugs, it uh, can be frustrating to hear this narrative of oh they're just not occupied, they don't have anything to do. Uh, you can have fully full you can have full lives, active lives, lives with so lots of sports and leisure activities and still use drugs and it not um, affect your life negatively. Yes, there is people can fall into drug use issues, um, but for the most part young people don't. And yes, the social determinants of health and social capital should be increased, always. Um, that should be something that's a priority regardless of um, trying to reduce um, the demand for drug use amongst youth. And that can support them in so many other ways than just um, preventing drug use. It can help prevent problematic drug use maybe and some of those things. So I can see where they're going with it, but it's just really missing the mark, um, which is frustrating. The government of Sweden today hosted a side event entitled Mainstreaming a Gender Perspective in the Treatment of Drug Use Disorders. This is of particular relevance to a lot of the work that Youth Rise has been doing recently, uh, including our position paper last year on young women who use drugs and our side event, which is on Thursday, uh, which is following up on that and presenting uh, a panel entirely made up of young women who use drugs to discuss the needs of young women who use drugs. So by comparison, this side event I don't think had a single woman who uses drugs on it um, and it was exclusively focused on uh, the gender perspective in treatment of drug use disorders. So the lack of community involvement is maybe unsurprising uh, if still disappointing. Uh, there was speakers from a variety of backgrounds, including one from the Swedish delegation, um, one who was working in service provision, uh, a World Health Organization speaker and a speaker from the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. So these speakers talked about a variety of issues including gender-based violence being experienced by women who use drugs, um, the need for yeah, a gender-sensitive response um, and the need for safe spaces in harm reduction services as well as recognition of women's roles which might differ from those of their male peers, uh, including childcare responsibilities, among other things. The uh, continual reference to gender sensitive responses and also references to intersectionality uh, was welcome, but I found it a little bit disappointing that despite this sort of progressive language, um, all speakers continually referred to women and men without any consideration for people who do not fall into this binary gender category. Um, the issue was raised in the comments, but they didn't manage to answer this question, um, which was disappointing. And yeah, I think 
CND is maybe not quite ready for uh, a side event discussing the needs of non-binary people who use drugs. Um, hopefully we will get there someday and otherwise this was a relatively uh, progressive and yeah, quite interesting side event. Hi, so the side event I'm going to talk about is South Africa's uh, cannabis policy approach. And uh, the reason why I chose this uh, particular event is because um, I belong to a nation where cannabis use and cannabis plant is uh, stigmatized and uh, uh, it is scheduled as an illicit drug, uh, sidelining the fact that it has been culturally used in our country for many, many years. Uh, so the whole purpose of this uh, webinar was to highlight the efforts made by the civil society members, uh, the government uh, to, to fight the, the, the problem of uh, drugs in, in South Africa. Um, the first and foremost problem was uh, uh, rescheduling of cannabis, uh, 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 cannabis plant as a Schedule 7 drug. Uh, to a schedule six drugs which would make it easier for uh, for for legalization purpose and also uh, it would make it easier for scheduling and control of uh, of the cannabis uh, in, uh, market itself because uh, once uh, the 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 substance is has a market so obviously it needs to be regulated through certain norms and in this case uh, a, a particular THC and CBD oil <clears throat> a percentage was uh, um, permitted uh, for, for the market um, so with, uh, with the uh, major objective of uh, protecting the patients against illicit drugs and uh, uh, from uh, potential diseases out there so this was initiated to sort of uh, um, collectively bring together the needs of people who who are in entire need of uh, medicinal cannabis uh, so it had it had to be started from somewhere and eventually it started with uh, decriminalizing the personal position of cannabis use uh, in, in case of South Africa and this uh, this whole uh, approach was achieved uh, by by engaging stakeholders and uh, to to address uh, the implication and way forward uh, for people who use drugs uh, for for them to choose uh, safer alternatives um, uh, to to live a healthier life um, and. This wouldn't have been possible without uh, uh, without considering Germany, Australia, and Canada in 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 in, in the whole debate because obviously they have been an inspiration when it comes to legalization. Uh, so what was being done uh, for for to achieve uh, these this um, legalization? Uh, there were there were some key points uh, which was discussed. Uh, which uh, which which goes like removal of uh, cannabis plants from Schedule Seven to Schedule Six or lower uh, uh, hierarchy, uh, listing of psychoactive substances at THC in Schedule Six, uh, CBD is listed in either Schedule Four or Zero depending on medicinal claims. So another side event I attended today is drug trafficking through gender lenses, women's involvement and impact on their lives. This was organized by the UNODC drug research se section. So they uh, detailed a report that had just been released by the Crim Just project uh, with collaboration between the EU, UNODC and Interpol. Um, so some of the um, data that I found interesting from this report um, was that, and obviously, um, cocaine use has increased over the past um, number of years. And um, it was good that they noted that drug trafficking impacts men and women differently. 
liked that they um, spoke about the need to focus on the social determinants um, behind women's involvement in drug trafficking. They did speak to the, about them um, not just as victims and vulnerable people, but also as people who have autonomy, but due to social determinants have to make decisions um, that support them, their lives, their family, etc. Data was that um, for most women, the decision to become involved in drug-related activities is shaped by limited choices, um, even though it is often voluntary. Women work longer hours for lower or no pay, less opportunities to enter the labour market. Um, I often find um, when it comes to reporting on on um, drug use, drug trafficking, that sort of thing, that they miss out on um, the women perspective. And actually this year, there's quite a few side events that are dedicated to the women's perspective. Um, so I'm looking forward to attending as much of those as I can um, because Youth Rise also has a panel on Thursday, a side event on um, breaking the barriers for young women who use drugs and the perspectives and challenges that we have. Uh, so it'll feed in nicely to see how other people are talking about the gender perspective in drugs and drug use, drug policy and drug trafficking, etc. Um, like this event. Hello everyone. I attended the side event of uh, 65th Sessions on the United Nations Commission on Narcotic Drugs. Uh, titled Developing and Strengthening uh, Communities to Prevent and uh, Reduce Substance Use through CARTCA International, uh, Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America in the various states in Brazil. Uh, on the event, uh, panelists from CARTCA International presented how coalition based on Brazil mobilizes their community integrating uh, 12 sectors which included government agencies, youth service organizations, parents, business, media, and many more. It also talked about uh, the logic model and talked about uh, local conditions where 38% of adolescents 12 to 17 years use alcohol, uh, where 84% sell alcoholic beverages to minors and do not ask for identity cards. It talked about the assessment process uh, where it showed the higher cannabis and alcohol during the age of 12 to 17 years. Uh, moreover, the sessions was uh, informative and I was amazed to see the effort which was made uh, in the community overall and being so specific for adolescents for substance use prevention. I enjoyed it a lot. Thank you. Hi, my name is Anami Michael and today I attended my first event for the 65th CND ending inequalities for people who use drugs and how the global HIV response can transform drug policies. Here we had different speakers from around the world and they were based their discussions around the targets, the 10 10 10 and the 80 60 30 targets. And they looked at the barriers and possible solutions. What governments can do, what uh, different stakeholders can do, what communities can do. And majority of the speakers talked about uh, stigma and discrimination plus criminalization as the major barriers hindering us getting to the targets by 2025. We had speakers call out for the need for services to be designed to the diverse needs of the people who use drugs, needs for the services to be implemented and monitored with and for people who use drugs, the needs for full protection of rights and solidarity to people who use drugs and people living with HIV AIDS and how the global AIDS targets uh, and strategies can influence the drug policy around the world. The need for strong solutions to decriminalize people who use drugs and I believe this will lead to uh, the avoidance of the constant dangers that uh, normally face these communities uh, during crises like what uh, we faced during the COVID-19 and uh, the war in Ukraine right now. Thank you very much. Our friends at the International Network of People Who Use Drugs today hosted a side event entitled Ending Inequalities for People Who Use Drugs, How the Global HIV Response Can Transform Drug Policy and Vice Versa. This was co-sponsored by a couple of government delegations, as well as the UNODC, UNAIDS, Medicine du Monde, and RCF. 
Uh, UNAID had a speaker who I will discuss a bit later, the presentation uh, Suki Beaver has made in relation to the global aid strategy. Um, but I also thought that the opening remarks from a representative of a network of people who use drugs in Ukraine, Helena Konienko. Uh, Helena talked uh, about the situation in Ukraine, the war, and the crisis that this has created for people who use drugs and other key, key affected populations. Um, a lot of hard work that has gone into the HIV response in Ukraine in recent years is being undone by the war. Their access to medicine and other uh, HIV related services is of particular concern, uh, especially in the territories occupied by Russian forces. The criminalization of people who use drugs is also cr creating a barrier to them fleeing the country, which is of course extremely detrimental to their health and well-being. This is all very worrying and uh, it was great to have Helena on this side event to put forward these issues uh, that are currently being faced in Ukraine uh, to back up some of the interventions that were made in the plenary and in the Committee of the Whole today uh, condemning the Russian war in Ukraine. Suki Beavers, as I mentioned, um, spoke about the Global Aid Strategy. Um, the Global Aid Strategy was produced last year and is quite a thorough and progressive document, especially in the areas of uh, youth-led or youth involvement and uh, community-led services. So Suki discussed the need to fund community-led responses uh, the disparities that we're currently seeing in funding for harm reduction services and community-led responses, and the need to ensure that the community is involved in the decision-making process. So in particular, she pointed to the disparity in reporting of community involvement between governments and uh, civil society slash community. So the government was reporting a much higher level of community engagement especially for people who use drugs and prisoners uh, than was being reported by civil society, community, the people who are actually doing this work. So stuff like that is quite concerning, uh, especially with the global aid strategy being quite ambitious and unfortunately needing to be quite ambitious if we are to get near our goal of ending AIDS by 2030. In the plenary session today, there was a couple of common themes among the statements. Um, the most significant of which being the almost universal, uh, although not universal, but almost universal um, and quite strong condemnation of Russian war in Ukraine and Russian imperialism and the impact that this is having on the people of Ukraine. Uh, France in particular, uh, on behalf of the EU, uh, made a very strong statement in this regard. Uh, condemning the war in, in Ukraine very strongly. Uh, they spent a lot of time talking about this. A lot of this speaking time was used up talking about the war in Ukraine. And in general, uh, yeah, a lot more time was used up talking about this than what I imagined. Uh, I thought that most countries would reference it at the beginning, but not use such strong language and devote so much of their speaking time to it. Uh, France, on behalf of the EU again, also called for an end to the death penalty, which is quite standard every year for the EU um, and there's still the death penalty for drug related offences uh, despite all of these years trying to call to end it. So um, yeah, it's kind of lacking impact perhaps. Um, and it says a lot when the bar is so low that calling to end a death penalty is, is quite a radical statement in CND. Uh, Switzerland also made quite a good statement. Um, they called for the protection of the human rights of people who use drugs uh, in particular and in general were um, yeah, focusing much more on the health based uh, approach to drug policy. Um, the UK, they also spoke uh, about Russia and Ukraine and expressed solidarity with the people of Ukraine. Uh, this is despite their policies uh, yeah, stating otherwise in terms of allowing Ukrainian refugees into the country. Uh, when they talked about drug policy in their statement, uh, they continued sort of this tough on crime rhetoric uh, that the Conservative government in the UK have been pushing for quite a while. Um, and this was this was quite disappointing to see and is really outdated 
um, yeah, rhetoric that you can arrest your way out of um, this drug problem, if you want to call it that. Uh, the best statement of the day that I saw at least came from Winnie Bianima of UNAIDS. Um, Winnie is the executive director of UNAIDS and called very strongly for access to harm reduction services uh, to ensure that harm reduction services are non-judgmental as well as causing, calling repeatedly for an end to punitive drug policies uh, and for increased funding and investment in com community-led responses uh, for people who use drugs. So this is continuing on from a lot of fantastic work that UNAIDS have done in terms of community-led responses and youth engagement as well uh, on the back of the Global AIDS Strategy last year and in general UNAIDS are leading the way in this regard uh, in terms of UN agencies and certainly related to drug use. So I hope that the UNODC might follow suit. Um, but in any case, it was fantastic to see UNAIDS use language, which we don't hear so often in the Commission on Narco Narcotic Drugs. So today is Monday. This is the first uh, day of the CND, the 65th session of the Commission on Narcotic Drugs. And it's been quite a long day. Um, it's about 9.30 Vienna time and in fact the day is um, still not over, the plenary is still on and member states are still delivering their opening statements. Um, it's, quite, it's been quite interesting this year. Um, we were sort of expecting this, uh, but a lot of uh, member states have very openly um, called out um, Russian aggression and Russia's invasion of Ukraine in their opening statements, uh, which gave a more openly political nature, nature to the negotiations than usual. A lot of other states then have called out um, this politicizedness um, of the negotiations this year, which is kind of out of fashion um, with how the, the Commission on Arcuri Drugs normally operates. So it's been very interesting to watch that today in the plenary, but it also unfolded in the Committee of the Whole, uh, where a resolution that was submitted by Russia uh, was sent back to Russia without negotiations, uh, because a lot of member states um, have expressed uh, that they will not negotiate this resolution because they do not believe that these negotiations can be conducted in good faith. Um, so these are very, very strong uh, political statements they are quite unusual for the CND, which is sort of a less political, technical uh, body that has traditionally been very uh, diplomatic and conducted decisions um, based on consensus. Um, so it's, been, it's going to be interesting to see how all of this unfolds during the week.